Thanks for coming to my talk. Um, I'm going to talk about um, disempowerment fantasies um, and how to use taking power away from players to create better games, which uh, may sound counterintuitive at first uh, because games are sometimes called power fantasies, but um, this is where my um, original thesis came from. Um, I wrote a thesis uh, on this as my um, uh, final bachelor's uh, thesis. Um, yeah, to, to dissect this assumption that games have to be power fantasies. Um, but first, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Val Tamer. Um, I have a bachelor's in game design. Um, and I've worked on uh, three different commercial games so far. I was an artist on uh, Dead Age. Uh, by Silent Dreams Entertainment, and um, for Daedalic Entertainment, I was a writer on The Night of the Rabbit, and a game designer, writer, assistant creative lead, narrative designer um, on uh, Ken Follett's The Pillars of the Earth, um, uh, which is an episodic adventure. Um, let's start with the definition of what I mean with disempowerment. Uh, what's important is that I mean disempowerment in a playful context and not disempowerment um, uh, in an involuntary, uh, in involuntary way. Um, so disempowerment in this case is a voluntary restriction of the player's power uh, in a temporarily limited and safe uh, playful space um, for the sake of their own entertainment, amusement and other psychological gains. Um, this basically combines um, uh, Johann Huizinga's um, uh, definition of play with disempowerment. So it's playful disempowerment, and that's important. Uh, it's not the involuntary loss of power. Um, even if it is in a game context, if it's not um, voluntary, uh, this doesn't apply. Uh, in video games... <laughs> this um, phenomenon can occur in all game genres, but the most famous one is probably survival horror. Because um, just um, thinking about it uh, intuitively, you can probably understand how a player could feel powerless in a survival horror game um, with uh, 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 overpowering enemies and limited weapons and scary environments. Uh, this sense of disempowerment is usually related to um, the perceived level of challenge in a game and um, the layers of game reality. And I'm going to explain that one. Um, but the layers of game reality and their communication channels um, uh, between each other um, is actually directly linked to um, how games can create uh, powerlessness in a player. Um, first, the level of challenge. Um, this is a, a graph from um, <coughs> The Art of Game Design, a book of lenses by Jesse Schell. And this is based on um, the flow theory by uh, Mihail um, Csikszentmihalyi. I know the name. I, I probably <laughs> pronounced it entirely wrong. But flow theory, famous uh, uh, psychologist. <laughs> um, and um, uh, this, this chart basically tells us that... Um, in order to reach uh, a, a pleasant sensation of flow in game that is being entirely wrapped up in the moment, enjoying it, being there, forgetting everything around you, that's, that's flow. Um, in order to reach that, the level of challenge has to rise in this um, wavy motion. Um, not necessarily that um, uh, regular, but uh, it has to um, rise, but it mustn't be um, uh, a straight line because um, by, by doing it this way, players have uh, a sense of um, becoming better than the game um, and then suddenly realizing that it's getting harder and harder and harder, but then they overcome this challenge and then they feel powerful again. It's this, um, uh, uh, this mixture that creates flow. And um, powerlessness is um, somewhere in the anxiety uh, category. Um, usually. Um, some rare um, examples can be in the boredom category as well, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's usually related to um, how challenging the game is. 
so to explain um, <coughs> what I meant by layers of game reality, um, this is also um, from um, The Art of Game Design by Jesse Schell, um, which explains that we have um, these different um, elements of a game that interact with each other. We have the player, we have um, uh, the game world, um, and uh, we have the virtual interface, and we have input and output. Um, so um, this is how they interact. The player doesn't directly interact with the game. They need a controller to do it. They need um, the visual and um, audio output in order to um, understand what's happening. They're not in direct contact. They have communication channels. And uh, based on that, um, I created this, um, uh, this structure of different layers of game reality, which um, are made up of uh, the player diegesis, which basically means world, um, but usually used in fictional contexts. Um, the player diegesis, um, the core diegesis, and the avatar diegesis. And as you see, um, the avatar is inside of the core world, so the game world, um, in an uh, objective programmed way. Um, and the player is outside of the game world and outside of the avatar, but the player can control the avatar with input. Um, the avatar can, um, uh, can deliver a subjective screen output, and the core game world can deliver um, objective screen output, and um, the avatar can interact with the world, and the world can interact with the avatar, but the player is um, as I said, can only interact with the world through um, the avatar. Um, and the black arrows are the communication channels, basically. And um, if this happens, um, if they're in some way distorted or um, uh, changed, um, powerlessness can happen. For example, um, if the controller input doesn't match um, what um, uh, doesn't create the same reactions <coughs> as it had before, it's chaos. Um, if the screen output um, isn't uh, in tune with what's actually happening in the game world, um, there's uncertainty. Uh, if the avatar can't control the game world anymore, there's a lack of agency and, and power to act. Um, and um, yeah, so, so these communication channels um, if they are distorted, a sense of powerlessness uh, can occur as well. But um, this is all very um, theoretical. <laughs> um, so this is why I'm going to um, list different mechanisms in games that can create um, uh, a sense of powerlessness um, as a design method. So how to design powerlessness in a player. Um, and after that, I'm going to go into why you would want that. Because in general, you don't want the player to feel powerless. You want the player to feel like they can interact with the game effectively and that, they can, that there's a challenge that they can handle. But um, in, to a certain degree, um, giving little bits of powerlessness can actually uh, improve the overall um, experience. Um, yeah, but why would we even care about this? Because um, video games can only be power fantasies, right? Um, but this um, uh, limits our understanding of the medium and our creative possibilities of how to use it, um, what stories we can tell and what gameplay we can design. <coughs> um, yeah, I'm going to... Um, I hope that they're gonna be understandable pretty um uh like with with not a lot of explanation because they're um you probably know what I mean. <laughs> um so the the first uh mechanism um uh, of the list is uh audio visual um disempowerment mechanisms. For example, um audio visual distortions. Uh like in um Amnesia the Dark Descent um uh, you can see things that aren't really there, um, the um, screen gets blurry, um, uh, it plays with the light. In, um, uh, on the right hand, um, Eternal Darkness Sanity's Requiem, there are the so-called sanity effects, which 
uh, create hallucinations, so to say, in-game hallucinations that go as far as becoming um, meta uh, hallucinations, like this one, where the game um, suddenly acts on its own and pretends to delete the save file. And um, the player can't do anything against it, but then um, the game basically goes, ha ha, just kidding, nothing happened. Um, so yeah, the player completely lost control uh, at that moment. Um, uh, there's also audiovisual restrictions, for example, fog in horror games, or for example, in um, Fatal Frame, where you can only see the ghosts um, looking through the camera, and otherwise you have no way of seeing them. Uh, in the um, core diegetic, the, the core game world, um, you can encounter spatial distortions um, in a sense that um, the world changes um, uh, its meaning. Um, this game is uh, called Eversion, um, where, which is basically a cute platformer, but um, there are eversion points, and when you um, walk into them, the um, let's say the um, the 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 parallel universe changes. So like you, you go into another um, layer of reality, um, and it goes from really cute, like on the left, to uh, horrible nightmare visions on the right. And um, the layout is still the same, but um, the meaning of the different um, blocks and characters are changed depending on in which layer of reality you're in. Then there is spatial restrictions, um, which can be something like there are guards that um, you have to avoid, um, which is kind of like a moving spatial restriction because their field of vision is what restricts um, uh, your path. Um, or stuff like in Soma, where you have to um, uh, use the uh, Omni tool to um, open doors, but you have to uh, upload the right stuff onto it first before you can open the door. Uh, then there's world meaning distortions, um, which is also a little bit like that Eversion um, game. Um, an interesting example is Default Dan on the left, which basically functions like uh, any other Super Mario side-scrolling platformer, um, but every <coughs> element that um, uh, you know from other platformers, like coins or spikes, um, actually have the opposite meaning of what you're used to. Uh, so coins kill you and spikes give you a boost. <laughs> um, uh, Something similar um, happens in Undertale um, several times. This example is where um, you have to defend yourself from arrows coming from all sides by um, just moving your uh, shield into that direction. But after a while, um, uh, other kinds of arrows occur that don't point towards you, but away from you. And they will jump to the opposite side at the very last second. So basically, you've learned, oh, an arrow comes from the top. I have to um, direct my uh, shield to the top. But since it's turned away from you, it's going to come <coughs> from the bottom. Then um, another uh, usually comedic mechanism is the distortion of controls, which can mean that you take um, uh, controls as the game genre um, usually uses them um, and just switch them around or you take the already existing controls in your game and change them at a certain point in time. Um, this can also mean that you take um, uh, very simple things in real life which happen automatically like grabbing something um, and make it very complicated and complex, um, like in Search and Simulator, where you have to control every single finger and can't just grab something by pressing a button. Um, the example on the right is a mini game from Mario Party 2, um, where the characters stand in the middle of the um, record at first, and then it spins very fast, and then everyone is dizzy, and the controls are. Um, uh, uh, or the opposite of what they used to be. Up is down, left is right, and you just have to walk to the middle. And that's the entire minigame. 
Then um, another uh, sense of um, disempowerment can come from not getting any instructions in any game in general, like no tutorial, just throwing you in there and you have to def uh, fend for yourself. Uh, and there's also restriction of controls, um, like for example in fi uh, the Five Nights at Freddy's series, where you can't really do much. You can control doors and light and look at the cameras, but you can't move from your desk which you might want to do uh, <laughs> if um, uh, the place you're working at is um, basically haunted by demonic animatronics. Um, but you can't. You can just sit there. And the restriction of controls um, adds to the horror and feeling of powerlessness. Um, you can also restrict resources known um, in, from every uh, survival game and um, uh, also often survival horror, um, but it can also happen in um, first-person shooters where you have limited ammo. Um, then there's also physical needs, which is kind of like a restriction of resources, but um, you have uh, uh, the you have um, a need for more resources over time. Um, so you don't only have to be um, uh, frugal with what you have, you actually have to get more with time. Um, then there's also the classic uh, power imbalance where the um, enemy is way, way stronger than the avatar. Um, or uh, the mechanism of suspended death, which is basically every... Um, uh, every arcade game ever where you can't really win, you can only postpone your death. Uh, and this is a kind of powerlessness as well, like you, you win, um, you can reach a high score but you can't reach an end. Um, then another uh, way to make the player feel powerless is um, defense mechanisms in the, in the sense of escort missions. There is something else that you have no direct control over um, via input, um, but you have to defend it as well. And this um, element of uh, lack of control creates the sense of powerlessness. Like, for example, in um, Ico or in Glover, where you have to defend um, uh, your rubber ball. Um, then on the layer of uh, narration, there is uh, incomplete or wrong information where your um, decisions are based on uh, so, uh, something that isn't um, according to the truth of the game. Um, this example here is this indie game called Mondo Medicals, where you get clear instructions um, uh, what to do. Um, it's usually just puzzles and mazes. Um, like follow the arrows to get to the exit, but you always have to disobey the instructions to uh, progress further, and just following instructions doesn't lead you anywhere. Um, and there's also the narrative disempowerment, as in you see something or read something and you can't do anything about it. It's it can be a cutscene, it can be a document, it can be something happening outside of your area of control, but this is a narrative um, uh, disempowerment that um, uh, occurs in uh, lots of games, sometimes not on purpose. <laughs> like when in, uh, in a cutscene something happens which you wouldn't have done if you could control your avatar, it's uh, uh, often it's not um, intentionally disempowering, but accidental. Um, then there's also um, forced decisions, like in Bioshock, where you only, at the end, uh, find out, oh, I've been brain controlled this whole time, spoilers. <laughs> 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 it's 11 years old, guys. <laughs> um, and uh, then um, there's the moral dilemmas, like in uh, Papers, Please, where you basically have to decide, oh, um, am I gonna earn enough money to um, get treatment for my sick son? Um, but then basically separate this man from his family? Um, or am I gonna um, uh, let him go through and risk losing my job entirely? Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, this was an overview of the mechanisms um, that can create powerlessness in a player um, if you choose to design, um, to design that. Um, usually they're not meant to be the, the core 
experience. Like this can happen, like in Papers, Please. It's basically the core experience. Um, but many games use them um, like uh, spices <laughs> uh, every now and then. And um, looking at the reasons why players would um, ever enjoy uh, feelings of disempowerment in their games, um, yeah, the, the reasons will give an insight into when you might want to do this. Um, so, um, the, okay, um, there is the, uh, there are the sources at the bottom in white on light gray. You will understand without the sources, but um, you can ask me later if you want sources on what's, what these theories are based on. Um, so um, the first one is the, um, uh, and, and this is my result of my bachelor's thesis, I was basically, okay, I'm going to make up a bunch of theories now why this could be uh, desirable. Um, the first one is the rich game experience theory, that um, players actually feel like they're playing um, a better made game, uh, which is more challenging, has more depth, and a more complex uh, experience. Um, and uh, something that enables them to get into a flow while playing, that they're not bored or anxious, but something that um, uh, enriches them. Now, the second theory is the thrill theory. Um, plain and simple, players enjoy adrenaline. Um, this uh, can be compared to like going on a roller coaster or seeing a horror movie, that um, they just enjoy um, the rush and, um, and or the following relaxation because um, uh, some players don't actually like the stress but they like when the stress is over and um, they feel better after the stress is over than if they hadn't experienced the stress at all it's, it's kind of like how when you're um, exercising and afterwards you're like oh I feel so much better now but during it you didn't feel so good uh, yeah the third one is the underdog theory that um, when the challenge um, is bigger in the beginning, um, winning is actually way more meaningful. Uh, that happens in a bunch of games that um, just throw you into the final boss fight right in the beginning and you're not supposed to win. Um, you're just supposed to see, oh damn, that's, that's, a, that's a hard boss. Uh, I can't win at all, and then you have the entire game to practice and train and level up, and then you can beat the boss, and you're like, yay, I've, be I've gotten so much stronger now. And um, yeah, the final victory is more meaningful that way. Um, the next one is uh, regression theory, um, which is uh, just enjoying temporarily um, giving up all responsibility and control. That depends on what type of game um, you're playing, but this can be de-stressing as well. Um, there's reframing theory, um, which is basically if you, um, if you exclude all the obvious solutions, um, problem solving will become more creative. And this can, um, on the one hand, work as a, um, um, like a, a a challenge for the mind, but also in order to get the player into new perspectives, also from a narrative sp uh, standpoint. Uh, then there's parody of vulnerability theory, which is basically making, um, taking a vulnerable situation and making it so over the top and comedic that you can um, deal with the subject matter without feeling attacked. It's uh, like a dark comedy, horrible subject matter, but it's so funny that you um, uh, it, enjoy dealing with it and it, it makes it possible to um, deal with it in a pleasurable way. There's also the uh, optimal learning theory um, which is basically based on um, the findings that um, humans are more likely to look for why they failed rather why they succeeded. So if you have a player fail um, uh, uh, certain times um, or um, have a uh, thing more challenging, they're more likely to learn faster and more in the long term. Um, and there's the safe practice theory, which basically says you can practice um, uh, challenging situations and frustrations in a um, safe environment um, that way. 
Yeah, and there's a structured experience theory, which is kind of like the the arts, the the, the art theory that um, people simply enjoy having um, artfully structured experiences um, as opposed to chaotic life. Like so much things happen in life, and things don't necessarily make sense. But if you can structure um, it in a thematic way, in like one story, one game, uh, one piece of art, um, it's just uh, satisfying because you can share it and it's kind of like a, um, a um, the affirmation that what you um, can relate to is a valid emotion so to say and um, yeah feelings of powerlessness are uh, a part of human experience so um, the conclusion is um, uh, yeah we should um, consider putting disempowering mechanisms into our games not all games um, but even um, uh, power fantasies like shooters, action adventures um, uh, can benefit and usually already use uh, disempowering mechanisms because it can lead to innovation in gameplay, um, enhance the immersion and um, game experience, um, creates better learning environments and enables us to tell more diverse uh, stories. Um, yeah. And now's the time for questions. <laughs> so yeah, we will uh, go around and give you the mic if you want to ask a question. Um, would be great if you can do it in English to keep it consistent. If not, that's fine too. So, but um, if, if you're able, that would be great. Any questions? questions? Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question on your uh, definition of voluntary versus involuntary. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a choice of playing the games, of course, but I feel like the games you mentioned, most of them don't give me a choice whether or not I want this power loss. Say, in, in the shooter, I want 10 shotgun shells, but I only get one. So, could you define that a little bit? Like, um, Yeah, the, um, the voluntary part comes from choosing to play the game. Um, you still have the choice to just stop playing and um, that's the whole voluntary part no, no game is going to force you to continue um, if you feel forced that's um, that means that the game does something right in another way I suppose but um, uh, yeah the voluntary part comes from it's a game you choose to play it you can just switch off your console or your PC whenever you want another question uh, first of all thanks for the talk and uh, since you work at Delic, how worked. does this uh, work? Okay, sorry. <laughs> how does does this at all apply to um, point and click adventures? Um, point and click adventures um, uh, work on um, information management. Um, puzzles are often based on what information you have at what point, and you have to collect information and tools. And um, uh, this. Um, this is uh, a big part of feeling powerless, um, not having the entire information. And um, uh, yeah, but um, some um, point of click adventures um, don't only go the, um, uh, the route of what information you get, but also use it narratively, like things that you can influence and things you can't influence, things that will happen either way. Um, and uh, some games also have um, mini games. So for example, the, the one that I worked on, um, uh, The Pillars of the Earth. <coughs> um, we had uh, um, quick time events and mini games, and um, we used those as well uh, in order to create a sense of um, uh, powerlessness and urgency. Like, for example, there's a scene um, where one of the main characters walks in a sandstorm, and um, instead of the regular walking, <coughs> where you just click on the ground and she walks. Um, you actually have to complete um, complete quick time events for uh, for every other step um, because the sandstorm is so intense that you can't uh, walk normally. But it's getting more complicated from a gameplay uh, point of view. So you can basically use this in all game genres. Okay, I see. Thanks. Another question. So. <laughs> uh, 
It's just a follow-up that you mentioned that you can create more diverse narrations mm -hmm. with this mechanic. Um, do you mean that these mechanics, that the idea of disempowerment can influence the plot or the player's experience? Um, well, it can um, influence. Uh, it it should define the player's experience. But I mean, um, what I meant was um, the stories um, should also be told through the gameplay. So if you tell a story that isn't a power fantasy, um, where you play somebody in a disadvantaged position, um, these mechanisms should come into place to um, uh, create an experience that. Um, uh, 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 that is true to what the narration is going on about. Okay, so to mimic the narration, basically. Um, yeah, basically, um, uh, if you s if you um, still create a like power fantasy game um, which has these uh, disempowering uh, mechanisms in it, it's not um, diversifying storytelling. Um, but using these mechanisms, you can tell more diverse stories by um, telling them about people who are not the powerful. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? So uh, I got one uh, on my own. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the, the things you mentioned, what could be disempowerment, the, the examples you gave, um, all these were, I would say, some kind of obstacles that mm -hmm. the player has to overcome. And in that sense, I, I wonder, isn't any game about disempowerment? Because, um, I don't know, Mario, uh, in Super Mario, you cannot run into spikes. That's an obstacle that restricts the player and um, restricts its, uh, his power. So, um, if, um, I, I mean, the, the absolute power fantasy would be in go uh, a god mode where you cannot die, where you can move through every object or whatever, can, can do whatever you want. So, in a sense, every game is based on restriction and disempowering in a, in a certain way. So, my question is, where do you draw um, for, for, for yourself or in your definition the line? Um, this is a game that uses disempowerment actively <coughs> And this is a game that only use it, it, uh, uh, use it disempowerment uh, because that's the game mechanic. So, um, well, I would say that um, all games are also designed power management. Um, so, creating the absolute power fantasy where there's no obstacles, you, you have no downfalls, actually won't feel powerful. Um, so uh, every game already has um, uh, disempowerment mechanisms. Uh, it was more about um, creating uh, um, a tool set and an awareness um, of uh, what, what you can use and for what you can use it. Um, I would differentiate between um, designed disempowerment and accidental disempowerment um, by its effectiveness, actually. Uh, if um, if you uh, have disempowerment in a situation that um, frustrates the player um, without giving them anything psychologically, like for example the the cutscene example um, where you expect it to have power over a certain decision, and then it just happens in a cutscene, and that is not um, and um, in if it doesn't. Um, say anything like if, if it's not part of the statement that the game is trying to make and it's it just happens to to be in there and uh, it has no purpose um, then it's accidental disempowerment and that's something that should be avoided um, anything that has a positive effects um, uh, even if it's not um, actively used by the game designer um, then it's like uh, uh, a lucky accident, I would say. <laughs> Any other questions? I'll take another one if I may. Um, have you looked at all into how different personality types of players um, like or dislike different mechanics? Like, for example, I really like Resident Evil and like having to manage my ammo and whatnot. And I really want to like Amnesia, but I hated it. <laughs> so clearly some people love it, though. So Yeah, um, different players have different frustration tolerances. 
Um, and I think uh, not only in general, but also in regards to um, where the frustration comes from. Um, like, um, uh, I haven't gone into depth because that's like a whole other um, uh, subject matter uh, again, but um, there are <coughs> different um, levels of um, frustration, uh, de desired frustration levels. And this will influence what kind of games players want to play. Um, like those with a with an extremely low frustration tolerance will play like idle clickers or something, um, or really easy games. And um, others play Dark Souls. And uh, um, yeah, uh, in um, the art of failure, um, there's a chapter on that, which is basically. Players have different frustration, um, like uh, different desires regarding their frustration. Any questions at all? Any other questions? Well, if not, then thank you well for your exciting talk.